This is Duke University. My name is uh, Rukia Dillahan. I pause because my, my mother and father would tell you my name is Elaine, um, but I changed my name. Uh, my family, um, my daughters, I have three daughters, and so they all have African names. And so at a Kwanzaa celebration in Raleigh in the 80s, um, they decided that my husband and I needed to change our name to African names. So they named me Rukia Karima. And so Rukia, Rukia means um, she rises on high, and Karima means she's generous. So my name, I go by Rukia Dillahunt. Well, I grew up during the Jim Crow days. Um, so I went through uh, drinking um, colored water, um, but I also taste white water, and it was the same. Um, and um, I got in trouble with my parents because they said, you know, even as a child, you can get arrested um, for drinking colored water. I rode on the back of the bus. Um, like Rosa Parks, that many, many southern cities, many youth um, sat in the front of the bus when they were tired of sitting in the back of the bus. And so some of my friends and I did the same thing. Um, in 1963, um, I was asked by the NAACP uh, to uh, integrate a movie theater. And so some high school friends of mine, um, we went and we did um, go into the movie theater. And, and that part of the time, the struggle wasn't as developed as it is now. Um, so we did get, you know, because you at that time, um, black people sat in the balcony of the theater. And you usually got in like when it was very late. You know, they had special showings. You never sat to the, the front. And so we went in. Um, and for me, that also showed because most of the people, my friends who were with me, we were light skinned. So they used that strategy. Um, and, um, you know, we got in, and um, at that point, we said that we were, you know, Negroes and we got arrested. Um, my dad. And my, my dad was active. He was an educator, um, and he had to secretly belong to the NAACP. You, at that point, you can be an open member if you were an educator. Um, and he um, didn't want me. He knew that I probably would get involved, but he really didn't want me to get involved my senior in high school. So um, when I got arrested, I was kind of you know, scared to say, I got to call somebody to get me out. And um, he was very proud that we did that. Um, so that was my first civil you know, disobedience piece. I went to a um, all uh, black Catholic school um, from K through 12th grade. And I had black nuns um, or some Puerto Rican nuns. So um, it's, really, it's really historical because I think there were um, maybe two um, nuns organization that were people of color. Um, and um, they were out of uh, Baltimore, Maryland, and they still have a convent there in Baltimore, Maryland. And when I'm in Baltimore, um, I try to see if some of my teachers are still alive. Most of them have passed, but there are a couple that still are there. Um, and so that was very interesting. Um, and historically, people have a hard time seeing that or believing that there is a whole, you know, sex of black and Puerto Rican nuns, you know, that existed. So that's how, what I got my, you know, elementary and high school um, education. So I decided to go back to school and um, the, the State University at New Paltz had an opening of, um, opening a new program, rather, in special ed of mental a master's in mental retardation. And at that time, simultaneously, my girlfriend and her husband had taken their child to the doctor and found out that she was mentally challenged. Um, and so I said, mm, this is a good thing. I'll go to school for that, and then I could help them out, you know, in learning what I did. So that's, I started in, in um, 
mental retardation special ed. So I think that might be my first sense of, you know, advocating, you know, for for what I, you know, for what I call people who are always needing some some help at the particular time. And so I think that's, yeah, I would call that that. And then I guess from getting involved with um, the African Liberation Movement um, and being in New York. Um, and at that point in time, you know, it's the Black Power Movement um, and, you know, reading and um, living in New York and being experienced with, um, you know, learning and about Malcolm X, you know, Martin Luther King, um, all of this is, you know, really there and realizing that, um, you know, even though things had somewhat changed and integration had begun, but that there was still a lot of work to be done in reference to, you know, the inequities and the segregational piece, even whether it was New York or particularly in the South, um, that things had changed, but it had not changed to the sense of, you know, a great improvement. Um, so, you know, learned a lot about, you know, um, African American history and about, um, you know, just struggle and that, you know, things won't change automatically um, and that it takes a mass movement um, to do that. So I'd love to dig more into the Black Workers for Justice. Mm -hmm. Could you tell me about how it started and what your role was? Sure. Um, I, um, we all, let's see, I got to go back a little bit because um, uh, some of us came down in the 70s um, here and um, the first organization I belonged to was the um, Black United Front. And um, that developed and became a national organization um, in the 80s um, and that developed a lot from police brutality um, and in Raleigh and it's ironic that people uh, I, and I say progressive people but people who um, you know know about movements and know things are wrong um, we all met um, at there was a Charlotte 3 um, and the Wilmington 10, people were rallying around those groups and trying to get them out of prison. Um, and um, some of us met then um, in the area, in Raleigh. You know, I guess a lot of the marches for them would be in Raleigh and the Black United Front, the same thing. So, you know, from there, uh, with uh, Black Workers for Justice, it was Kmart workers, women, who actually, um, came, you know, started, they were being mistreated, not paying fairly. I think somebody got fired. Um, and they came in Rocky Mount and came to one of our organizers there. Um, and we found out about it and, you know, started working with them, trying to fight th for them to get their, you know, job back and to end their case. And from that grew um, the spark to say, you know, we need to have an organization of, of workers. And so that's how Black Workers for Justice, you know, became um, through the various struggles. Um, and um, we also had um, developed, I think in 86, like the Women's Commission, Black Workers for Justice Women's Commission. I want to spend a little time on that because, um, you know, what the women in um, Black Workers for Justice always fought for um, was the fact that we would be in leadership roles um, and that whether it was, you know, we could call it the executive committee or the national coordinating committee, but it had to be majority of women or at least 50% of women to be on um, in the organization. And that has held to this day for 31 years. Um, and back then, that's a really big, um, you know, step um, particularly for African-American women um, because, you know, the quote-unquote feminist uh, movement, you know, people assume was, was white, um, but there were, you know, uh, lots of, you know, African-American women, 
you know, struggling within their organizations, you know, whether it was, you know, SNCC or Black Panther Party, you know, to, to really uphold their leadership roles um, and not be, you know, seen as somebody always fixing the food or doing daycare. You know, um, and I want to say this, just jumping the gun with Black Workers for Justice, what we do is that um, the Women's Commission, every March 8th, usually we have a program on, uh, for International Women's Day. And what we decided to do organizationally was that the um, men would be in charge of daycare and food and set up, but they could not set up like the technology piece or uh, anything like that because we wanted to, you know, uh, learn to do that ourselves, one, but we also wanted to empower other women workers that, you know, how to conduct a meeting, how to write leaflets, and how to begin to organize uh, your work committees itself. told us earlier that you began your teaching career in New York mm -hmm. um, and so I'm just wondering when you moved to North Carolina how did your teaching experience change? Okay um, well and when I when I came to, to North Carolina in 78 um, they um, I came to Durham first to to look for a job um, and then um, I um, Durham wasn't responding fast enough, and I went to Raleigh um, and um, just walked into, I went to central office at that time, and um, I, I met this uh, black man who ended up being a very good friend, and he was assistant superintendent, and I told him I had a master's in special ed. He said, a master's in special ed? I don't think we have anybody in Raleigh with a master's in special ed at that time. That was 1978. Um, and so, um, you know, I got hired. I changed my field to the alternative high school in Raleigh, and that became my love, and that was another advocacy piece. You know, I felt that special ed had their federal laws now, um, and their parents were fighters, and, you know, it will continue. Um, but then when I moved to um, Phillips High School, Mary Phillips High School in Raleigh, um, I realized then that's my first encountering, uh, r realizing that students are pushed out of school. I didn't have the concept of school to prison pipeline, but I had the, the, the prism of school push out, drop out. Okay, when I went to the alternative school, because when I read the folders of the students um, and saw minor offenses that they had done, and it got them one, either to be arrested, two, to get suspended long term and get so far behind that they don't go back to school. Um, and so that, you know, I became really passionate about that population and was really, really glad because that was a risk taking move for me because I had been to Enlo since 1978. Um, and I went out of the classroom for three years to be president of the union. And then I came back um, in 90, 95, no, 96, I think. And then I m went to Phillips part-time, and then I went full-time um, there at Phillips. And so it was, um, it was a, a experience, and I realized that this population would need more advocacy. Um, you mentioned earlier that you first started to notice students being pushed out of the system mm -hmm. while working at Phillips. Can mm -hmm. you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. You know, when students, how students um, would um, be accepted to Phillips was that um, schools, guidance counselors, or principals, um, or parents um, could refer their student there. But if a parent referred, they would have to go through the school system. So um, to counselor to get the records, you know, because we would ask for test scores right from elementary school absence, you know, um, suspensions, you know, um, and um, anything pertinent that people would want for, you know, like transfer. But it wasn't just an automatic transfer. Reading the folders, I would see two things in, the, in my mind. One, in third, fifth, and sometime eighth grade, 
um, the students were doing very well on standardized testing. Um, but their grades didn't show that. Then I would see through the suspensions that they would be behind based on the number of suspensions, whether it's for cell phone, whether it's for cursing, whether it's, you know, because um, a lot of times students try to get out of the situation and the way they do that is they try to leave. And when you stand in front of somebody and they're trying to leave, you know, your tendency when you want to leave is to push. So when you touch a teacher, you know, you get, you can get arrested, you know, for um, assault on a federal employee. And school systems oftentimes use that. So from those experiences, I would see, like, why, you know, and I would say to the students, my first question to them, I would say, do you know you're smart? No. I said, well, do you know what you scored on your reading test in third grade and then in fifth and then in eighth? And they were saying, oh, well, you know, a lot of them would say, well, yeah, I like to read. But, you know, they never, nobody never said, you're smart. You need to be in school. Um, and the other ones was just to ask them, what did they do to get suspended? And, of course, their story will vary from what was on the paper. Um, some would probably be true, but a lot of them would probably be what they wanted me to hear. And I would say, well, I just want you to know all your suspensions, which they didn't know, follow you wherever you go in Wake County Schools. And that was shocking to them. So, you know, that's when I realized that, wow, you know, Phillips was a gold mine. Um, and it had to, you know, be really good um, educationally and be able to accept the very students you know, and the personalities that we get. And they can learn and they change, you know. And you can hear them when the first report cards come in. Wow, this is the first time I had an A in a long time or a B, you know. And that would bring tears to my eyes because they too then realize, you know, at that point that they could do, you know, um, if they only, you know, wanted to do. And if people were behind them. Produced by Duke University.